guys, we are ready to restart. Uh, just one thing that I forgot to say, if you are interested in these kind of models, well then the Bible for this is uh, Simon Wood's book uh, on generalized additive models in R. And I left a copy there uh, in case you want to look, have a look of what kind of is, uh, if you want to see what is the level of that book. Okay, so now moving to the second session. Now we go beyond mean modeling. Uh, we are going to look at gamless models and quantile gums. So here, uh, first I, I start by describing this GAM model for location, scale, and shape, also called GAMless. Then I introduce quantile GAMs. And then I show how you use this model using MGCV and um, QGAM, and the QGAM R package. So starting with the GAMless models. So recall the, the GAM model structure, what we have seen before. We are modeling the conditional distribution of y, um, given some covariates x. And our conditional distribution is parameterized by some parameters theta 1 to theta p. And we typically, so, so far we have only modeled one of those, which generally corresponded to the expected value of y given x. And we did so by having some fairly general effects uh, which, uh, we, with an additive structure. And then we have the link function. So an example of this is the scale of stu student t, this uh, GAM model, where we are modeling the conditional mean, and then we have a scale parameter and a shape parameter, which is the degrees of freedom of the t distribution. Then now we are moving to this generalized additive model for location, shape, and scale, or GAMless, where now we are not only modeling the mean, but also the scale, that is the variance, and other shape parameters of the conditional distribution of the response. So we have, a, again, a fairly general distribution with several parameters, but now each of them can potentially depend on our uh, covariates, x. So what we have is essentially p additive models, one for each um, parameter, and each of them will come with its own uh, link function and with a set of um, effects, fj's. So the simplest example of one such model is, the, is a Gaussian GAM, where now we don't have an additive model only for the mean, mu, but also for the standard deviation, uh, sigma. So as you see, for the standard deviation, for example, we are going to use the log, uh, uh, the, the log link function because we want to make sure that when we model our standard deviation additively, this cannot go below zero. Right? And um, so this is the simplest kind of uh, gambless model. And if you look at the motorcycle data set, so we had, as before, the dashed line is our, the, how the mean value of the acceleration changes with time. But now we don't have constant variance. We make so that the uh, variance of the, the response acceleration is allowed to change smoothly with, uh, uh, our, with, with time. And the kind of model formula you will use uh, to fit this in MGCV is, again, you use the GAM function. But then your model formula is a list. And the first uh, for, uh, like sub-formula in this list is the model you're using for the mean. And the second formula is the model you're using for the variance. And the family of this is the Gauss LSS, which means that you're using is a GAMless but with a Gaussian family. Then another um, gamless model that we will see in the um, examples is uh, one based on this sine arc sine distribution or shash. And this is more complicated. This has four parameters. The first of which controls the location or mean. And as you can see on this plot on the top left, as we change this parameter mu, we are shifting, just shifting our density. Then the second parameter controls the, controls the scale or uh, variance. And as you increase this parameter, tau, on the top right, we are getting something that is more and more dispersed. Then if you look at the, then the third parameter controls the skewness or asymmetry. If you increase this parameter, so if it, this parameter has a positive value on the bottom, so you see this on the bottom left, we are getting something skewed to the right. And uh, for negative value, we get the density that is skewed to the left. 
And then we have another parameter, the fourth one, that controls the tail behavior. This is delta. So if delta is negative, you get something that is more and more fat-tailed, like the, the black density. And as you increase it, you get uh, thinner tails, uh, which is the green density. So if you, you can use this model within um, MGCV. And then your model, the way you fit your model is the same as before. You're saying, my family is a shash. And then your model formula is again a list. The first subformula is going to be the model for the mean, uh, uh, scale or variance, skewness, and tail behavior. So here we are modeling each of them as a smooth function of our variable x. I think, and as you can see here, I'm putting several quantiles of the conditional distribution of y given x. And you can have fairly complex behavior. So you can have skewness to the left here, skewness to the right. The variance also can change. So you can have quite a lot of flexibility. Then, of course, the question, one question I might have in mind is why is this useful? So why you should be interested in this kind of models? So one context in which this is useful is when, uh, for example, when you're doing forecasting on quantiles, you're not interested in just knowing how the expected value of y changes with x, but you want to have a good idea of how the whole distribution of, or at least several quantiles changes as you change one or more covariates. Second example is uh, essentially when you're doing uh, inference with GAM, uh, all the values like um, outputs like p-values confidence intervals, generally they are valid if the model for your conditional density is at least approximately correct. So if your model is wrong, and for example the residual variance is not constant, you can't quite trust uh, p-values or confidence intervals. So for example, if you see here again the motorcycle data set, if you fit a Gaussian with constant variance, you will, you will have that your uh, confidence interval really overestimate the uncertainty uh, on this side. While if instead if you allow the variance to vary with, with time, you will have uh, confidence interval that have better coverage. And finally, even if, suppose that you're just interested in really just modeling the expected value of y given x, then still you would like to make so that each weight uh, the weight of each observation in your regression is in some way inversely proportional to the variance. So here in this scatter plot, we have that the variance changes in a kind of sinusoidal way. So we have high variance here, low variance here, again high. And you would like to have uh, so that a point here of, uh, around minus one where we have very low variance, you would like it to have high weight because there is low uncertainty there while instead you would like to have a low weight where you have a lot of uncertainty. So what it turns out that if you take the variance into account, you often have better accuracy even when you're just estimating the median, and that is because you gave the right weight to each observation. Okay, so this was a brief introduction to gamless models, and now we move to quantile gums. So again, we are in a regression setting. And what we have seen so far, we are in a distributional regress regression case, so where we hope we can find a good model for the probability of y given x. So we have a lot of options for this conditional distribution, uh, binomial gamma, as well as the gamless models that I've just uh, described. And uh, in quantile regression, we typically uh, are considering a continuous response. So we assume that y, what uh, our response variable is continuous, not discrete. And uh, what we need to define to understand quantile regression is the, the CDF, the conditional uh, cumulative distribution function of our uh, response variable y given x, which is, of course is just the probability of y being smaller than any specific uh, value y, and this depends on x. So the tau quantile, where tau is between 0 and 1, is obtained just by inverting our um, conditional CDF at any specific uh, value, uh, tau. So if tau is uh, 0, 5, inverting the CDF will give you an, uh, the median back. So these just uh, show these uh, kind of in picture. So this is a, um, suppose this is your conditional um, PDF, probability density function, then of course, the CDF is just its integral, and it shows here, it's shown here. 
And then if you want the quantile, you, uh, 0, 3, for example, you will uh, fix value of tau to 0, 3 and just invert uh, the CDF. So when you are fitting a probabilistic gam, so what we have seen so far with the distribution, when we have an actual model for this conditional distribution, you, of course, have automatically um, uh, estimates of the quantiles, right? Because just uh, when you have done it, when you do a distribution of gamma, you just have a, a density function for each value of x, and then you can get the CDF of this inverted and get automatically all the quantiles you want. And there is a global structure that keeps each of these quantiles, these dashed lines, together, right? So there is the global. Uh, the probabilistic model that is determining what is the relative position of all these quantiles. But when you do a quantile regression instead, you are aiming directly at the quantiles mu, and you don't have any global model for this conditional distribution, which means that if you want to have a, to want to have a median gamma, so tau 0, 5, that is in itself one quantile regression model. And then if you want to fit a different quantile, such as quantile 0, 8, you will do that by fitting a different model. And there is no global distribution model of holding these two together. So they are independent regressions. So as I said, the, the, the tau quantile is defined by inverting the conditional CDF. But for quantile regression, what is useful to know is that it can also uh, mu, the, 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 the quantile of interest, it can also be seen as the minimizer of this expected loss. And this loss is the so-called pinball loss, which is shown down, down here. This is symmetric when you're trying to estimate the median. Penalized observation following, following all your feet more than those that fall above it. And you'll do the opposite when you want a high quantile. So if we were in a linear quantile regression context, so without smooth effects, then uh, what we'll be, we will be doing to estimate our regression coefficient is just to sum up the pinball loss associated with each individual observation and minimize that. But in our case, we are using, in this GAM context, we have, uh, of course, um, we are modeling our quantile tau as a sum of some potentially smooth effect or random effects. And so what we minimize is, actual, uh, is actually our uh, pinball loss plus the penalty on the wiggliness of the effects, which is the same as the one we have seen before, uh, controlled by some smoothing parameters. Okay, so this is kind of the, the, the fitting framework. Uh, and then, okay, again, you might wonder in, uh, in application, why should I be interested at all into doing quantile regression rather than standard GAM models? So one simple example is, uh, is illustrated by this income versus age data set. So for example, in this case, you might be interested in knowing how uh, does the income of the average person, so what relate to age, in which case you might be interested in using a median regression, which is this uh, red line, rather than a mean regression, which is much more affected by some uh, relatively few very wealthy individuals. And a related point to that is that is the resistance to outliers. And essentially, I've taken the same data as I, sh I showed in the previous slide, and I added an artificial, extremely uh, wealthy individual with an income of 30 million. So I added this point. And then I refitted my median gum and my Gaussian uh, gum. So the solid lines are the two curves that I had before from the median and the Gaussian gum. And then what you see is that because the mean regression is not robust, what happens is that it gets affected by these massive outliers, and, it, and it essentially it collapses back to a straight line. While instead, if I do a median gum, I still, still the defeat is somewhat affected by that outlier, but still, because of this robustness property, um, EBA is better, it doesn't collapse back to, to linear. Then in application, especially um, by depending on what application you're looking at, you might be interested in some specific quantiles. And in particular, if you do, for example, electricity demand forecasting and uh, 
you know that you should be able to satisfy uh, top demand, so you, you don't really care what might be the average demand. You, want to, to, you would like to uh, fit a very high quantile of demand because you're interested in how big the demand could potentially be. And similarly, if you are an urban planner, maybe uh, you want to, um, to determine the size of some flood protection or some flood barrier. You want to know, and you're modeling rainfall, you don't care really about what is the average rainfall ex that you can expect on every, any given day. What you care is about how much can it, what is the potential maximum rainfall we can observe. And also in that case, you might want to be uh, I want to be looking at a high quantile, such as quantile 95. And then maybe scientifically, one of the most interesting aspects is that the same explanatory variable may have a different effect depending on which quantile you're looking at. So if you look again at this income versus data uh, versus uh, age data set, what you see here is that the income of the top 1% reaches its peak uh, around 50 years old. While instead if you look at the median income, maybe that reaches its maximum around 35, and then it kind of levels off. And then again, instead if you look at the, top, at the bottom 1%, it might actually peak around 30 and then uh, decrease. So in this kind of, in one dimension, maybe you can see these things by eye. But when you're actually modeling something in multiple dimensions with several effects, then it's kind of interesting uh, looking at different effects uh, across quantiles. So here, for example, I'm modeling electricity demand as a function of temperature, uh, time of the year, the trend, and, um, and a holiday kind of binary variable. And here you have the effect of each uh, variable on each quantile. So the dark is the lowest quantile and the light blue is um, a high quantile. And what you see here is, that, for example, the effect of the position along the year, where zero is the 1st of January and one is the 1st of December, changes depending on which quantile I'm looking at. And for example, I see that, um, that uh, at the year's end, you have that the lowest quantile drops more than the than top quantile. And then, for example, if you look at down here, the, the effect of this binary variable, the effect of having a holiday, is much more strongly negative on demand when you look at the low quantile than when you look at the high quantile. So this, you can get quite a lot of, of insights into looking at this. And then, of course, the last, uh, the last advantage is that because you have no uh, assumption on, this, on the probability of y given x, you don't have to put a massive effort into trying to find a good model for this conditional distribution. And you don't have to spend time maybe trying to find a transformation that makes your residual approximately normal. And again, the reason for this is that you're fitting these quantiles uh, independently and there is no uh, global model, uh, global probabilistic model that kind of holds them together. Okay, then to see how to handle these models in um, MGCV and QGAM, uh, I need to fill in a couple of details about the quantile GAMs. Uh, so QGAM is the package we use for, for fitting and handling these models. And this uh, package is based not really on the pinball loss, but in a smoothed version, which we call the ELF loss. So as I said, this is a smooth version, and it has a parameter, lambda, that as you decrease it, you recover the original loss. So at the bottom here, you see in red the... the um, the original pinball loss and in black our elf smoothed loss. And as you decrease lambda, you recover essentially the original loss perfectly. And um, in, in the software, actually, you're not controlling this parameter lambda. You're actually controlling this, uh, a parameter called an argument called error. And this error force between zero and one. So as you decrease this, you're decreasing lambda. So you're getting something closer to the original loss. So in practice, when, you, when you're working with QGAMs, if you increase this error, remember you putting it above 0 to is, doesn't quite make sense. So, um, yeah, so anyway, when you increase it, uh, you're getting generally faster computation, so your model will be fitted faster. 
and in generally more stable is less likely you get some warnings or stuff like that but you are getting more bias in because you are approximating this loss so by default this error is put to 005 which um, in practice seems to give a good uh, compromise between bias and, and speed okay and then in terms of model checking with quantile model as I said we don't have any model for the condition distribution of y given x which means that if you do for example qq plots it doesn't quite doesn't uh, make sense looking at them because you you don't have any probabilistic model so there is nothing you want really to um, you don't want to compare the empirical distribution of your residual to anything because you have no model for that but instead what you can be looking at is the proportion of residual that are negative and in particular, for example, if your fit if tau is equal to 0, 2, it means that your fitting quantile is 0, 2, and you expect 20% of the residuals to be negative. And then um, you can do then, again, use this check 1D function to look across one uh, variable like x. And then if you use this layer here, grid Q check 1D, what this does, this is again an example that I showed before, the expected value of y is quadratic in x, but we are ended up fitting a linear quantile gam. This ends up dividing your data in two parts. But then if you, st if you bin the residual depending on which value of x uh, they fall in, and you look at the proportion of negative residuals in each bin, you get this plot here. So the black uh, points here are the proportion of negative residuals in each bin across x and you get this quadratic pattern so you see that you are missing something and then again this in this case you don't need to be to do simulations because again there you have nothing to simulate from because you don't have any model but what you can do to get this confidence is that you look at uh, quantiles of a binomial and you just check uh, how many negative residuals you can expect all right so it's pretty similar to what we we saw before and then okay it's not over uh, <laughs> uh, okay I wanted just to go over the um, so you have this other file this other HTML file so I'm gonna open it here but if you want you, you have it as well you can look if it's too small you can look on your computer so I start with an example of a gamless model so one thing to, that is kind of important to know, you can't use BAM, so these big data methods don't work with gamless models or with quantile GAMs. So it's something we are working on. Uh, but these methods are still not available uh, for gamless. So the first data set I look at is this uh, grip strength uh, data set. So here I'm just loading the data and plotting it. What you have here is age against grip strength uh, measured in ectograms I think uh, and then okay then I want to fit a simple gam and I do it with uh, this gam v function and I say I want uh, average uh, grip strength to be a smooth function of age and then again the, I use this AV's argument to say I want to do 50 to simulate 50 data sets of kind of residuals to do my residual checks and then this is again this grid check function so again I'm checking across a variable age and I'm binning my residuals but now instead of being looking at the mean which is what I did before I want to be looking at the standard deviation so this plot is the standard deviation of the observed residuals in each bin so you see that you have this kind of linear pattern so you know that the variance is increasing uh, left to right and then again you can get this uh, confidence interval by simulation so here we see that we are missing a variance pattern right and to take this into account then I can consider this Gauss LSS model so a Gaussian where you are modeling also the variance and I fit it here so the model everything is as before I, but I have to specify that I'm using this Gauss LSS model and then my model formula is a list where I have that the mean uh, grip strength is a smooth function of age and the same, the, the variance of the, 
of the grip strength is going to be also a smooth function of age. So if I fit this, and then I repeat my check, and I'm looking against the standard deviation of the residuals, I see that there is no clear pattern. You have some points that fall outside the, the interval, but that is fine because these are 80% intervals. And anyway, what it really matters is that you have no systematic pattern across age. So having done this, I can plot as I did before. So again, I say plot on my model, and I say print because I want everything to be plotted in one page. And this is going to be your effect of age on the grip strength, on the expected grip strength. And this is the effect of age on the variance. And typically, you see, this is, says S.1. And the dot one is there because it's saying this effect belongs to the second uh, linear predictor. So when we look at our model here, this, this, any effect put here that we put here will appear just with S, and any effect appearing here will be S dot one. If we had the third uh, term in this uh, formula, it would be S dot two, etc. So, okay, so these are the effect on mean invariance. Then we can, do, we can be even more sophisticated. We can say, okay, we want to look also at whether the distribution of the residuals is asymmetric and whether the asymmetry changes with, um, with age. So I load this package because it contains this skewness function. And what I'm doing here, essentially, again, bin my residual, calculate the skewness on each bin. And what you see here is that yeah, we have some very big departure from what you expect under your model. And then also we probably have a, a pattern where the skewness is decreasing uh, with age. So to take this into account, I can uh, load this MGC fan family, which contains the shash uh, distribution I was talking about before. And then we fit this model, and, what, and we use this model formula. So we say the location that has the mean is a smooth function of age. Same for the scale of variance. So again, now we are also modeling the skewness as a function of smooth function of age. And then this, this is saying just that we just have a, an intercept in the kurtosis model. So the, we are assuming that the tail behavior is constant as we move across age. And I say, okay, family equals shash. And of course, again, simulate the residuals from my model. And then I repeat my check across age uh, with the bin skewness, and I get that I don't have any more that decreasing pattern we have up there. And of course, you still have some occasional departures, but still is a big improvement compared to what we have here. Then, of course, you can compare your models if you want in terms of AIC. So you can say AIC of my three, uh, three models, and this will give you the degrees of freedom uh, that you're using for each model and the AIC. Then if you wanted to go one step further, we can even look for kurtosis, tail, tail behavior. So this function is again coming from that package I loaded above. And we could be looking at whether we want to model also the tail behavior as a function of age. Then depending on which exercise you do then in the, in the, in the hands-on part, the, there might be a reference to the, this uh, dense check layer. So if you want to do an exercise, that, there is only one exercise, I think, that contains this. But if, if you want to work on that, you can refer to this part, uh, which you have. Or you can ask me to just to ask me exactly what does this layer do and how does it work. OK, and then moving to quantile modeling, so to quantile GAMS. Here we, we need the uh, QGAM package. And here the main function is the QGAM. Uh, function, and this is essentially the same as GAM, but is fitting a quantile, a single quantile GAM. It could be zero, uh, quantile 0 0.5, that is the median. And then you have another function with this MQ GAM. What this does is the same as QGAM, but is more efficient when you want to estimate several uh, quantiles at once. So if you want to estimate quantiles 0 0.1, 0 0.5, 0 0.7, you'd rather be calling this MQ GAM function, which is uh, faster. But then what we actually use here is the QGAM V and MQGAM V, which are just kind of wrappers around those two uh, functions I just mentioned, which give better visualizations. And then, okay, so then the first, again, I look at this income versus age data set, which I am loading here. 
and I say I want I want to use QGAM V, so I want to fit a single QGAM uh, model, and I want uh, income to be a smooth function of age. And here I'm modeling quantile 0, 05, so the median. So this fits the model. Then I can, if I want to do predictions, I can just call predict on my fitted model. And this standard error equal true is saying that I want also the confidence interval to be computed. So having predicted, so here I'm simply, follow, uh, simply plotting, uh, just producing, producing this plot, I'm plotting uh, yeah, the, the raw data and my fitted quantile with the confidence intervals. Okay, so this is, is pretty much the same thing, uh, works exactly in the same way as with the standard GAM. The only additional thing that we had to specify is that, that we have to say which quantile we are interested in. Then uh, if we want to fit several quantile at once, we can use this mqgamv function. Everything is the same, but now we are giving a vector of um, quantiles, so between 0, 1 and 0, 9. So this will fit all of them which means that now uh, we store our output here. This thing will be a list of five different QGAM models. All right, so when you want to, uh, so for example, if you want to do predict and fit, uh, predict and then plot, you have to go uh, through a loop. So here I'm plotting my data and then I say predict and, I have, and then I have to reference to which particular value which of particular of the five quantile GAMs I want to be predicting, right? Okay, so these are my uh, five quantiles against the data. And then, of course, you can do the usual things you do with the GAM. So, for example, you can say, you can call summary, and this is will, but then you have to refer to a specific model. So this is saying, take my first quantile and call summary on that, and then you get usual information specific to, to one of the quantiles you have fitted. Then we can do uh, more complex things. So for example, here I'm considering some uh, data on weekly rainfall in the Paraná state of Brazil. And the data come from 600 uh, weather stations, uh, which, are, which I'm just plotting here. So this is lo uh, longitude and latitude of the 600 stations. And um, so having this data on mean rainfall or average rainfall, what we can do is say, okay, let's consider a quantile gum. And we are looking at the median, so this median rainfall. And uh, so we want to model precipitation as a, so here I want to have a, a smooth, a spatial effect of lo uh, longitude and latitude with 25 basis functions smooth effect for uh, the distance from the sea, a cyclical effect for time. Here time is the week of the year, so from 1 to 53. So you want the two ends to match. That's why we are using a cyclical effect. And then an effect for elevation. So this, this fits this. Then we can plot it, as we will do for a standard gum on one page. And you, what you get, you get this is your spatial effect. This is the distance from sea effect, which is fairly weak. And similarly, the elevation effect is not very strong. And then you have a much stronger uh, cyclical effect of time. Then, of course, as before, we can fit several quantiles at once uh, if you want with this mqgam v function. And here, uh, so the model formula, everything is the same. The only difference is this, that um, yeah, I'm specifying a vector of quantiles. And then here I'm increasing a bit error just to kind of do the computation a bit faster. And then, uh, so the thing here is that now we have uh, five models. If you call plot on your feet and you say select equal one, this means plot the first effect, which is this. But because we have five models, these will give you this kind of grid and this is our spatial effect on each quantile, from quantile 0, 1 up to 0, 9. And the scale is the same so that you can see if on one quantile the effect is stronger than on another. So here we see that the effect of the spatial location is much stronger on, the, on quantile 0, 9. So for extreme precipitation, the spatial effect is stronger than it is for, for low precipitation. 
And then, so this is the bivariate effect. Then again, we use select to plot the other effects, uh, which are the effect of distance from sea, uh, seasonality, and elevation. And what you see is that you, get, you see nice, uh, quite big differences depending on which quantile you're looking at. So the effect of the distance from the sea is stronger on the high quantiles than it is on the low quantiles, so on low precipitation. Similarly, for the cyclical seasonal effect, it's much stronger uh, seasonality on extreme precipitation. And then you have, sometimes you have to be careful because, for example, here you see it seems that only <laughs> when we're looking at the highest quantile, you have a strong effect of elevation. But then if you look at the summary for this quantile, quantile 0, 9, you will see that it's not significant. So you should always look at this plot and then also at the summary to have an idea of what you're looking at here is an actual, uh, actually significant behavior. And then, of course, you can do, um, you can have these interactive uh, plots in RGL also with quantile gums. So what I'm doing here is saying, this is my fitted, uh, this contains the five fitted uh, quantile models. And take, I say, take the fifth one, fifth one. Then I say, take my, the, use this SM function to extract the first effect, which is the 2D spatial effect, and plot it in 3D. Okay, so this doesn't appear in the HTML, but it should work on your computer. And then I can do more sophisticated stuff. So for example, for this kind of data, you might wonder whether the effect of space changes uh, with time. And to verify that, you can say, okay, let's fit a quantile gum on quantile 0, 09. So we're looking at kind of extreme precipitation. And we say, I want to plot, uh, to, to, um, to use the, the following model for this kind of high quantile. I want to have a, a tensor uh, product effect of uh, space, uh, longitude and latitude, and I wanted to make it change with time. And so I say, and I used this D argument to say these two, longitude and latitude together, they form a single effect, which is based on thin plate splines, and which is an isotropic effect, which, mean, which makes sense because uh, longitude and latitude are measured in the same units. And I want to use 20 uh, basis function for this. And, I want to, and then I want to make this 2D effect, I want to make it change across time. And I want to make it change in a cyclical fashion, again, because we're looking at the uh, week of the year. So this will end up fitting a three-dimensional effect. And then I put uh, also my elevation effect. So if I fit this, then I have the problem of having fitted a three-dimensional thing, which I would like to visualize in two dimension. And we do it using this plot slice function. So plot slice, first argument uh, is this. So here I'm using SM and I say, take my model and extract the first smooth, which is this big uh, tensor product uh, effect. And then given that I can't plot this three-dimensional thing in two dimension, what I do is to say fix and this fixed argument, let me pass a list of uh, essentially this is just a vector and saying time, just specify which of these three variables I want to be slicing across. And I say I want to slice across time. And here I just provide a vector of times from 1 to 53 across which I want to be slicing and plotting a two-dimensional spatial effect. So if you do this, you get this plot. And this essentially your, is your, your effect of uh, precipitation, sorry, effect of spatial location on your extreme precipitation, and we make it change, uh, we make it change with time, right? So this is one way in which you can plot the 3D things in, in two. Right, so you can get some insights here. You can say, okay, this is how precipitation pattern changes uh, in time, depending where I'm looking at. And then, of course, you can also do things like, again, using this plot RGL to get interactive surfaces. It works as before. You say, okay, I want to extract the first effect from my model. And then you have this extra fixed argument because you have to specify one slice that you want to be looking at. And say, here I'm saying I want to be looking at the special effect at the 11th week of the year.
Okay. So I think we can move to the final, so the second exercise part. Uh, sorry. So you should be looking at this exercise two sheet. And um, so again, the first three exercises, they are kind of focused on uh, demand forecasting, uh, for uh, electricity demand forecasting. And uh, the first is about gamless models. The second is about quantile gums. The third is kind of, we want to compare quantile gums and gamless in terms of predictive accuracy. But I don't know, if you're new to R, uh, I wouldn't try that one. So I wouldn't try number three. I think a nice one for seeing a gamless model is the fourth one. This one, gamless modeling of BMI, is kind of a nice one. Uh, instead, if you want to look at quantile gums, you can look at the exercise two. Uh, yeah, so the third one is really is a bit advanced. 